What an incredible story. I mean, in the Old Testament, he takes a donkey, gives him a voice, and he speaks. Takes a dog into a witch doctor's house. And in the middle of a storm, drops a New Testament, a Gideon, right in the middle of the house. What's the chances? You don't think God's active today? Absolutely. He's hunting you down. He's looking for you. Amen? I'm going to tag team with Art this morning. Um, how many remember the movie Good, Bad, and the Ugly? All the old people knew it. Okay, there you go. Spaghetti Western. Well, we might do the ugly, bad, and good. Well, we're we'll finished with the good this morning. Let me share just some, some stats with you from the Bible, okay? I want to bore you with this. These are pretty amazing stats. Are you ready? How many know the shortest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 117. No, shortest chapter, not verse. Psalm 117. Longest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 119. What's in the center of the Bible? Psalm 118. There are 594 chapters before Psalm 118. There are 594 chapters after Psalm 18. So when you add the numbers up, you get 1,188. So what's the center verse of the Bible? Psalms 118, verse 8. What does that verse say? Well, when you want to know God's perfect will for your life, read it. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. That's God's perfect will for your life. Now, the Bible was written about, by about 40 men over a period of around 1,600 years. It dates back to 1,500 B.C. to about 100 years after Christ. Revelation, written about 95 A.D. The men who wrote this scripture were given inspiration by God according to 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures inspired, right? The first translation of the English Bible was initiated by, you know the name, John Wycliffe but was completed by John Purvey in 1388. Been around a long time. The Bible has since been translated in part or in whole into over 2,000 languages and dialects. The Bible was divided into chapters. See, it wasn't written like this originally. There were no chapters and verses. We, we always quote chapter and verse, but that came along later. Stephen Langton actually divided the Bible into chapters. The Old Testament was divided into verses by our Nathan in 1488. So we've had that for, for many years. The New Testament by Robert Stephanus in 1551. So it hasn't always been in chapter and verse, but we've had it that our whole lifetime. And the entire Bible was divided into chapters and verses, first appeared in the Geneva Bible in 1560, just like this form came about in 1560. And I think as Art said, the Bible is still, as of today, January 31st, 2021, is still the largest seller of all books published. Okay? Now, let me give you some statistics on some research. George Barna, you've heard of George Barna, Barna Surveys, reported on what American churches or the following percentages about Christian denominations, quote, and a couple of them are mm, questionable, on whether they agreed with this following statement. The Bible is totally accurate. Okay, so we'll go down to about 10 or 12 of these. Now, all adults, here's the percentage, 41%. Now, to me, that was shocking. And then he starts with the Seventh-day Adventists. Some would question whether that's true Christian, but we'll go with the Adventists, 64%. Our own fellowship, the Assemblies of God, 77%. I've been wondering, where's the other 23%? Baptists, any type, there's several Baptist groups together, 66%. Takes a big dip now with the Catholics, 26%. Church of Christ, 57%. Episcopal, 22%. Lutheran, any type, 34%. Now remember, this is, this is the response to the question or the statement, the Bible is totally accurate. Methodists, any type, 38%. Mormons, very questionable, 29%. Non-denominational Christian, 70%. Pentecostal slash Foursquare, I'm not sure why the AG went in there, but 81%. Presbyterian, any type, 40%. Now, this is according to the survey that Barna took. Three of them are over 70. That's the AG, non-denominational, and Pentecostal Foursquare. That's 70% or over so nearly three-quarters, a little bit better than three-quarter percent of those agree that the Bible is totally accurate. 
So when Barner wrote his book, The State of the Church, back in the early 2000s, he conducted a survey of Christians. This is what he discovered about their knowledge of the Bible. Now, I will say this, it was about 15, 16 years ago, but since then there have been many surveys taken since then, not just by, 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 by George Barna's group, but also Ligonier, uh, Pew Research, and the numbers are actually going down. Not good news, but here. 48% could not name the four Gospels. Almost half of the surveyed Christians could not name the four Gospels. 60% can't name five of the Ten Commandments. Okay? Barnes says this. He says, Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't know what it says. And because they don't know it, they've become a nation of biblical illiterates. Kind of sad, isn't it? The state of Scripture in America. Newsweek, when they were still a magazine a few years back, wrote an article entitled, No Illusions in the Classroom. The article told about 26, pe about 26 people in the college classroom. They were ranging from 18 to 54, so the traditional age of those who came back to school. All these people had completed at least one year of college work. They were given 86 questions to answer, which centered on simple facts about the world. Here's what some of these people said in answer to those questions. Ralph Nader was a baseball player. Christ was born in the 16th century. J. Edgar Hoover was the 19th president. Or I'm sorry, 19th century president. Sid Caesar. Now some of the older crow will know who Sid Caesar is. Sid Caesar was an early Roman emperor. <laughs> Dwight D. Eisenhower was president in the 17th century. These are people in college. So if you like that one, listen to this one. This is a group of high school juniors and seniors who were actually in a college prep, one of the top-rated prep schools in America, prepping them for college. So they're given a quiz about the Bible. Here's what the results are. Sodom and Gomorrah were lovers. The New Testament was written by Matthew, Mark, Luther, and John. I'm not making these up. These are, these are coming right off the stats. Eve was created from an apple. Jesus was baptized by Moses. And Golgotha was the name of the giant who slew the apostle David. So, ignorance abounds about Scripture. Okay? Because there's so much biblical ignorance or illiterance in America and in the world, there's also the ignorance of the true and living God and our Savior Jesus Christ and the precious Holy Spirit and everything in regard to who they are and how they function in the world. Amen? So, on Tuesday night, December the 20th, this is a few years back when Barbara Walters was still doing her expose shows, she did a show entitled, some of you may have saw this, it's called Heaven, Where Is It? It was right before Christmas, so, you know, the idea of Jesus coming in birth and all that. So she did a, she did a program called Heaven, Where Is It? How do we get there? Okay? She interviewed different people from different faiths about heaven. And this is what, quoting, quoting from that show, this is what some of them had to say. This was the uh, Catholic Cardinal Theodore McCarrick of the Roman Catholic Church there in D.C. He says the purpose of life is to come to the end of your life at peace with the Lord so that you may find an eternal happiness in heaven. This life is not what we're made for. We're made for heaven. We're made for the future. Sounds good. He moves on to the Jewish rabbi from uh, Neil Gilman from New York Jewish Theological Seminary. He says the purpose of life is to live a decent life that you do for its own sake, not for getting a reward. There is a tremendous emphasis in our tradition about what you do with yourself in your lifetime here on earth. He moves, or She moved on to the Baptist, Reverend Calvin Butts, who was pastoring the, the, um, the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, who says he has seen heaven, tells Walters that heaven is eternal joy and happiness because you are at one with God. And then she goes to the Buddhist. And she actually traveled to the Himalayan mountains. And she visited the home, quote, of Buddha, which was the Dalai Lama. Who says the purpose of life is to be happy and that you can accomplish that by warm heartedness. He says heaven is best, is a, is, is best place to further develop the spiritual practice. For Buddhists, the final goal is not just to reach there, but to become Buddha. It's not the end, he tells Walters. 
And you could come back as an animal. If you do very bad, badly, kill or steal, you could be born in an animal body. Walters also talks to longtime follower Richard Gere, actor, who is a, who is a devout Buddhist, he says, I don't think necessarily heaven and hell happen in some of the life. I think it's right now. Then she gets to the Muslim, the Islamic scholar Faisal Abdul Rauf. He really drew a crowd. He says, there is sex in heaven. Two people laughed. The real life is the next life. And based upon how we live this life, it determines where we shall be in the next. Well, there's some truth there. We are told we will be in comfortable homes, reclining on silk couches. So we're given the delights of sex, the delights of wine, the delights of food, with all their positive things without their negative aspects. Seems that some have taken him literally here on earth, too. Terrorist and heaven. This is Jihad Jarar of Islamic Jihad. He was actually incarcerated, probably still is, in an Israeli prison for a failed suicide bombing. He tells Barbara Walters that evening that only Muslims go to heaven. And the reason I chose a martyrdom operation was to spend an eternity in paradise. He says he was taught that everything good is in the garden in paradise. And that the Lord promised the martyr who lost his life and lost the world on earth, that he promised him these 72 women in paradise as honor, as respect for him. Okay, the Muslim view of the afterlife. Then the atheist. No, heaven doesn't exist, he says. Actually, this was a woman, Hell, this Ellen. Hell doesn't exist. We weren't alive before we were born, and we're not going to exist after we die. I'm not happy about the fact that that's the end of life, but I can accept that and make my life more fulfilling now, because this is the only chance I have, says Ellen Johnson, the president of the American Atheist Society. So there's some viewpoints of the last 15 years of what people view heaven like. Amen? But I want to take you real quickly to the actual Word of God. The Word of God actually describes itself. Okay? So if you want, I'm going to go through these. You can get your text or your, your, your electronic advice, or you can get your Bible and start flipping with me very quickly. I'm going to go to Isaiah 55, verse 10, and Jeremiah 23. Isaiah 55, verse 10 says, the rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth, just like this past week. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Jeremiah 23, verse 26. How long will this go on? If they are prophets, they are prophets of deceit, inventing everything they say. By telling these false dreams, they are trying to get my people to forget me. By the way, it'd be a good time to study the book of Jeremiah in the year and the day you're living right now. And just as their ancestors did by worshiping the idols of Baal. Let these false prophets tell their dreams, but let my true messengers faithfully proclaim my every word, there is a difference between straw and grain. This is where he says, Does not my word burn like fire, says the Lord? Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashes a rock to pieces? John 6, words of Jesus. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. They came out of the mouth of Jesus. They are living words. Hebrews 4.12, you know this one very well. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It gets into you. It gets to the very depth of who you are. To your brain, to your body, it gets in your joints. That's the living word of God. It is active. That means it's powerful. It is sharp. That means it cuts and it opens and it reveals. Acts chapter 7, 38. Moses was with our ancestors. He did not baptize Jesus. That part's not in there. The assembly of God's people. That's not the church either. The assembly of God's people in the wilderness when the angels spoke to him at Mount Sinai. And there, get this, Moses received now, that's Old Testament. Hang on for those who threw out the old. Listen to this. And Moses received life-giving words 
to pass on to us. For those who want to take the old, throw it out, and think it's dead, and it has no effect on us today. Listen what it said in the book of Acts. Moses received life-giving words to pass on to us post-beginning of the church, post-Acts chapter 2. The word of God is life-giving. Ephesians 6, 17. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Here's, a, here's an unlearned fisherman who probably had a lot of um, southern brogue, who had a lot of terminology in his vocabulary that you would not want to use during Sunday school, okay? But this man got his life changed like that woman we just saw on the screen there, who's going out running, who's all about herself, climbing the ladder, but she happens to stumble, just happens to stumble on this little book in the middle of the road. Peter says, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. It didn't say they smoked it. It said they are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field, but the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. You want to you con, contradict the whole flower thing and the grass thing. All you need to do is begin to get the word of God in your heart. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You begin to share that. You know what you're doing? You're sharing life. You're sharing something that's alive that changes hearts. Ask George. What happened to George in Wayland, Missouri? What's the chances? What happened to her on the road in, the, in, a, in a storm? In the middle of the road in a storm. And God took his own word and opened that book to her in the middle of the road. Charles Spurgeon once told us sitting in a nice restaurant. This may relate to all of us in this room right now. As he's eating, as he's eating he, kept, he, kept, he kept noticing a rather angry looking man who was sitting across the dining room. Now, that's all pre-COVID, so they could go inside. And he scowled at him every time he looked his way. And finally, Spurgeon decides to go over and speak to the man to see what the problem was. You ever done that? However, as he stood, he realized that what he had been seeing was his own reflection in the mirrors that lined the wall. <laughs> you may not always like what you see in the mirror of God's Word, but what you see there will always be truth. It'll always be what's best for your life. And Paul said, for now we see in a mirror dimly, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. There are four ways God's words, God's word is at work in us right now. As you're sitting here right now, it is teaching. It's teaching you and I. Jesus said in Matthew 28, go ye therefore. We get that go ye with our preaching all. But he says, you need to teach them what I commanded, everything I commanded you. How do you do that? Do you do it all from your memory? God has kept. He's used men. He's used inventions. He's used, he's used technology. We think the printing press was all outdated. In their day, it was incredible. It was the internet of its day. And it's because God wanted to get this word across the world through ministries like Gideon's. Our own fire Bibles, teaching books that go across the world because men and women need to be taught the Word of God because it's profitable for doctrine. The Bible instructs us in what we know about God and instructs us on how to live. Who taught you how to live? Hopefully your mom and dad did. That's what your parents are for. The Bible teaches us what God's will is. We can know God's desire and His heart. Romans 12 Listen to this, too. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Amen? Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's not a person in this room today who wouldn't want to know what God's perfect will is for you. Don't you want to walk in that? Don't you, don't you want that good and pleasing and perfect will for your life? Scriptures are standard for testing everything that claims to be true. If it doesn't measure up to the test of the word of God, you can know it's false. 2 Timothy 4.3. Listen to what he, Paul wrote to Timothy here. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, 
They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Hello, what I just read you all go, biblical illiteracy. People would rather feel than know. We live in a feel-good society. You could point fingers at every addict on the planet and say, oh, but listen, my friend, you and I live in a culture that is addicted to everything. It's, it's, it's just, it's proven. God help us. Maybe to be addicted to his word and his spirit. The Bible is also good for rebuking. How many love a good rebuke? <laughs> Nobody enjoys that, but you know what? It brings a fruit of righteousness later on. It's kind of painful at the time, right? But God's word is to be received, believed, and this is one of those things that just kind of rakes against your neck. Obeyed. Oof. Obeyed. Because the word of God is the final authority in our lives. See, when God's word is deliberately disobeyed, his word will be used as a rebuke in our lives. Has God ever rebuked anybody in the room? You don't have to hand, put your hand up, but okay, I've got hands. Some are pointing at their wife back here. It's shame on you. Don't rebuke your wife. Let the Lord do it, right? Well, it is the reproof by which the Holy Spirit turns that individual from sin. Amen? It may hurt, but in the long run, you'll be the benefactor of it. It will save your soul. Revelation 3.19, those whom I love, now these are words in red, by the way, so this is your Savior speaking to you. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and, you know what the last word is? Repent. Repent. Change your direction. Change your direction. Proverbs 3, 11, 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Now, I, I could ask everyone individually, let's sit down, let's talk about how your mom and dad treated you, what happened in life when you were growing up, were you ever rebuked, were you ever disciplined? Did you enjoy it at the time? And let me ask you this, how many of you deserved it? Now, those with angels, halos, straighten those up, and we'll talk to you later. Or maybe you think your kids are the best. How many remember the day, if it happened at school, you got it at home? They backed up the teacher. Oh, what a new concept. They actually, let's move on. I feel the belt of truth already, Amen. John 14, 21. I normally don't read from this, this translation, but I kind of liked how this said it. The person who knows my commandments and keeps them, that's who loves me. And the person who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, now get this, and make myself plain to him. For those people, man, I just don't understand. I just can't get him. I don't understand. Listen. You can't get any plainer than that. If you know my commandments and you keep them, and they're pretty simple, that's who loves me. And the person who loves me will be loved by the Father. And I will love him. I'll make myself plain to him. You don't need anything else. He's given everything he needs to give for you. I don't care what your education is. I don't care what your IQ is. He will make it plain to to you. And then there's correction. Correction. God will use his word to guide, direct our lives when we get off course. Amen? How many love that lady talking to you, Siri, Alexa, or the GPS woman? How many like that? God wants to restore our thinking, to transform our minds so we might live by the mind of Christ. So the Bible will correct false notions and mistaken understanding. It always does that. 1 Corinthians 2.12, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. I love the word freely. How many like free? Number four, he trains us in righteousness. God's word not only sets us on the right path, friend, but he keeps us on the right path. We were talking about, um, I think it was Sunday night, when we were talking about uh, testimonies. You know, God bless the man or woman who has come out of the deepest, darkest pit with the, we say, what an incredible testimony. 
like that woman's there, or George's. Or we, some of you have these testimonies from deep darkness to incredible light. But it's the same God who keeps that one who was raised in the church. And you say, well, I ain't got much of a testimony. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. When you're living in a culture that's dark and wicked and evil, and you walk with a light, that is a testimony to God's incredible keeping, saving power. Never underestimate, never look down on your testimony. Please do not do that. Amen. Psalm 119, 11. The psalmist says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not. Everybody knows that one, don't they? That I might not what? Sin. sin. So there's a direct correlation with the word of God in your heart and sin. Or keeping you from sin. Amen? Some of you remember Samuel Clemens, alias Mark Twain. Now, he's not known to be a diehard Christian, but he wrote these words. Most people are bothered by those passages of the scripture they don't understand, but the passage that bothers me most are those I do understand. <laughs> a lot of truth to that. So we get more out of the Bible when we let it get into us. Amen? And Peter said this in 2 Peter 1.20, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Now, that's a lesson in the last few weeks by some prophets in America. Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Don't count him out. He is in perfect unison with this word. Can I get an amen? amen. He's the one that teaches you this word in your heart. He is the one. Oh, he uses teachers, human beings, but it's the Holy Spirit that connects, that gives the wisdom. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit does. You know what Abraham Lincoln said? He said, I, I'm gonna, give me, I want to quote some folks from the history here. Abraham Lincoln, which I think I heard just tearing, tearing something down in San Francisco of Abraham Lincoln. That one just blows me away. I'm, I'm not sure I ever understood that, but anyway, whatever. He says, I believe the Bible is the best gift God's ever given a man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. 16th president said that. How about W.E. Gladstone? He wasn't a preacher. You know who he was? He was a prime minister in the late 1800s of Britain, of the Isles. This is what he said. He says, I have known 95 of the world's great men in my time, and of these, 87 were followers of the Bible. A couple of the quotes I thought I'd just throw in for fun. He said, we look forward to the time when the power of love will replace the love of power. Then will our world know the blessings of peace. Amen. That's pretty relative for a guy who wrote it 160 years ago. And he says, nothing that is morally wrong can be politically right. Amen. 2021. Nothing that is morally wrong can be politically right. Oh, George Washington said this, it's impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. He was sharper than most people give him credit for. How about Napoleon? He actually said, the Bible is no mere book, but a living creature with a power that conquers all that oppose it. Daniel Webster. If there's anything in my thoughts or style to commend, the credit is due to my parents. I'd like to read this one to all of America. For instilling in me an early love of the scriptures. If we abide by the principles taught in, our, in the Bible, our country will go on prospering. Maybe that was prophetic from Daniel Webster. But if we in our posterity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. I wish he could come back right now and preach that. About Horace Greeley. Horace Greeley says, it is, it is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible-reading people. The principles of the Bible are the groundwork of human freedom. Can I, this, this is going through my mind early this morning when I'm praying in, in the aisles here. How many, how many have quarantined? COVID quarantined. Several. How many have actually had COVID? Okay, so if you had it, you quarantined, you're, you're locked up in your house for, what, two weeks, 12, 10 days, whatever. Um, how did you feel during that time? Sick. <laughs> you can't leave, right? You can't go anywhere. 
And you might feel ostracized or, or these beady eyes pointing at you, condemning you for getting out, knowing that you shouldn't be around us. And, but the fact is, for a short amount of time, you actually lost a lot of your freedom. Now, you could, you could function around the house, go out in the garden, all that, but you couldn't get around the public, the people. It's almost like you were a leper and your house was the leper colony, correct? You, you felt a sense of something that was lost. But as soon as they say, hey, you're out of quarantine on November 20th, you can get out. Woo, hallelujah, you go to Country Mart and buy a gallon of milk. <laughs> or go to work. Did people still look at you funny? I don't know about you. But what did you feel? Wow, tomorrow I'm out. A sense of freedom. That's what happens. Jesus says you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The words he has given us are freedom. That's what it feels like. No man, no government, no weapon formed against you will prosper. But you, in your mind, knowing the words, the truth, the light that's been shed abroad in your heart, can stand in true freedom. Somebody can point a gun at you, but you can say, you know what? I am still free. You do what you want with it, but I stand in freedom in Jesus Christ. Amen? And when Bill and I would sit on that cold concrete floor down there at the jail, I could look at those men, and say, those men who would weep sometimes when they'd tell their story, especially when we'd talk about their families, their, their, their wife, or really their children. They would start weeping. And I said, gentlemen, I'm telling you, with Christ, you might be behind bars, you might be sitting in this prison down here on a concrete floor wearing an orange suit, but you're freer than some people who walk around who have bank accounts and cars and trucks and families who live the good life out there. Just because you're behind bars doesn't mean you're not free. Never forget that. Vance Havner once said, I believe the Bible is the word of God. He said, I don't understand it all, but I stand on it. And I'll finish up with this. Some of you remember Chuck Colson, right? If you remember Richard Nixon, you remember Chuck Colson. But God had mercy and redemption in mind for Chuck Colson. He tells us the change that came over hundreds of men in a prison in Newton, Iowa, he went there to step, and that's when he would go into prisons. They would let him come in. He would establish Bible studies. Two months later, he, go back, he goes back for a visit. He finds a group of men that are very excited. He said, they swarm around me with their Bibles. He signed over 100 of them. They wanted them to sign their Bibles. And he listened to their stories, their testimonies. When he finished speaking, he said, was, instead of politely applauding, these men jumped to their feet and began chanting, This is my Bible. It is a lamp to my feet. This is my Bible. It's a lamp to my feet. He said, How could this happen? He said, At least half of these men had been unbelievers, yet the whole prison had somehow been transformed. The staff there at the prison explained, These Christians here, they told all the newcomers that came into the prison about their faith and invited them to study the Word of God with them. See, the Bible just doesn't make converts, it makes disciples. Disciples for Christ. It teaches them a better way of life. It teaches them the ways of Jesus. It can happen in prison. It can happen in your house. No other book has stood the test of time like the Bible. Year after year, people have tried to stamp out its message. They're doing it today across the world. But its power to change continues to move and do that for lives. It's been banished in countries. It's been burned. Skeptics have criticized it. But these skeptics have come and they have gone. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Amen. Some of you remember Voltaire, the French atheist. 1800s is what he said. In 100 years after my death, the Bible will cease to exist from the face of the earth. But you know what the beauty and the irony of this, or should I say the justice, is the home in which he made that statement is owned by the Geneva Bible Society. They're using it as a printing press to send Bibles around the world. So God always has the last word, capital W. No matter who stands against it, no matter what is said against it. Karl Marx said that religion is the opiate of the people. Hmm. The communist countries ban the proclamation and the reading and the study of his word. But communism and every ism fails. But the word of God still stands in the earth. Will stand forever. You can burn this book, but you can't burn the message. You can burn me, but you can't shut up the voice of the church. Amen? Where is your life today because of this? 
Is this a part of your life? Have you eaten of it? Now I ain't going to tell about food because you're getting ready to go eat. I don't want your stomach to start growling. But we're, we as Americans are accustomed to really good, delicious food, right? Our palates usually don't go hungry. Everybody have breakfast this morning unless you were fasting? Do you have food in your pantry and food in your home? We've been an overly blessed nation. Oh, my. We're, I tell you what. Uh, Clarence and, and, and the guys were all out here, was it Friday? Friday afternoon. Pastor Ben, you were there. And that truck backed up there. I don't know. Was there eight pallets? Six, eight pallets? I'm not sure another pallet will fit in the food pantry, but we're going to give it all away. That food usually comes from stores that didn't sell it. You know what Haiti would do to get something like that? The kids in Haiti? And it's sitting right over here in this metal building. And we're going to give it out to people who come for it. Food. We have workers that will break their backs. We've got a team of people who will hook up that trailer with that van early Friday morning. And they're going to go to Operation Food Search in St. Louis. And they're going to get in line. And all that bread you see in these over here, they're going to bring that back. They're going to bring other stuff back. What they can get, they're going to put back in that building so we can give it out. Food. Do we do the same, the same effort with this food? I have found God reveals himself through his book. Oh, he speaks through ministers, and he'll speak through your brother and your sister. And your he'll do that. The gifts are still in operation. He speaks through those. That's how he builds his church. That's how he draws people to himself, to reveal himself to people. He's been doing it for 6,000 years. That's why he told the Jews when they came out of, out of Egypt, hey, let them go. They're not going to the promised land yet. See, they need to get to know me first. Then they'll begin to understand my ways. He tried to get them to go out in the desert. You know why I want them in the desert? Because he doesn't want them in a beautiful city where there's too much offering. Because the first thing the human being will do will take the shiny stuff. Come on. We want the best stuff. We want smells good, looks good. But in the desert, you won't find much of that. But you will find life-sustaining water in him. That's his book. And like Art, Tom, Jan, Rusty, Nick and Becky, these couples, they work to make sure this is in every place in a public setting that they'll allow it. Even in our schools. And you know, I was talking about this with a ministry the other day. Now, some of you, you've, you've been around, and you understand the, the small communities used to really revolve around what? The church. Not that way anymore. It revolves around what? The school. The school. The school district. See, we've got people, live, we have more people that live outside the city limits than we do in. So we're a, we're a community, not just the city limits. But that school district is what's, it's the commonality of all of us, Right? So thank God he allows us to touch through that school the Word of God. And the Word of God instructs us, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. You want to know why we give out wipes at the beginning of school? You want, you want to know why we do baked bread? You want to know why we give out tissue and feminine hygiene products? Why we go buy packages of, of fresh undergarments for boys and girls in the elementary? Because of humanity. There's a book instructed us to do that. You know why we offer them a cup of cold water? In Jesus' name, because a book instructs us to do that. You know why we love our neighbor? Because a book instructs us to do that. You know why we love each other? Because the Bible says they'll know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. He was talking about the church. Look at your neighbor and tell him the book tells me to love you. Come on, Dwayne, tell her. Because the book tells you, but it's more than a book. It's his heart. It's his mind. It's his spirit. This is alive. The Holy Spirit breathes through this thing. You and I must get it in our heart and we must get it into the hands of whoever we can. Amen, Art? Would you stand with me? My prayer this morning is this. If you do not know the author of this book, it's going to be, we're going to take an offering in just a moment. If you don't know the author of this book, you're missing the greatest most incredible philosophical ideological mind-boggling relationship you've ever had 
much as you love your wife and your husband. And I do. I'm devoted. Are you devoted? I remember those vows you took. What were those, what were those vows? Do we all take the same ones? We'll, re, we'll renew them for you. Okay. For better, in sickness, richer, till... You got that one, didn't you? We all got that death one right there. A death to us part. The fact is, isn't that the same vow you take with Christ? Except he's the one that holds the vows to us. And he sticks with you. If you don't know him, you can today. He will literally give himself into your life. And your life will change for the better. I didn't say you're going to get financially wealthier. You may not have everything you want on this earth according to your neighbor. But the riches that he's going to deposit in you, you've never tasted of before. It will change your life in here. Peace that you've known not of. Joy, you never know where it's coming from. You don't have to know. You can be in the midst of a dark room. When people are being depressed from COVID-19 and the death around them, you can all have peace and joy welling up. Why? Because he lives in you. But if you don't know him, the author of this book, he doesn't live in you. I'm not talking about just a knowledge, a relationship that is committed. You're in a marriage with Jesus. A marriage. Would you bow your heads? Father, if there's one right now that's not in marriage with you, who've not committed their life, pray right now, believers. Pray. Pray. Intercede right now. Come on. Pray right now. Pray. No man come to the Father lest he be drawn. In this room, there's someone this morning that is away from God. He is drawing you to himself right now. And this word, he wants to deposit this in your life. He loves you. Man, he gave his own son for you. Gave his son up for you. He knows what you did. He knows what you're doing. But he loves you anyway. He says, if you'll come to me, I'll exchange all of that darkness for the light that I'll give you. If that's you this morning, slip your hand. I want to pray with you right now. If that be you right now this morning, slip up your hand. If you mean business with God. Yes, time is growing short. He said, my spirit will not always strive with man. There's coming a time. Look around you. He won't strive with you. He'll back away. You don't want to miss your time right now. He loves you. This is heaven and earth. This is heaven and earth, heaven and hell. This is eternity. You can know him. Is that you this morning? Let me see your hand. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. I saw two or three hands go up there this morning. Folks, would you pray with me right now for the two or three hands that went up this morning? Father, in Jesus' name. Father, I've known men, singers. I've heard of deacons who served in those roles for years. But they went through the motions and never actually were born again. They never had an experience with you. Today, for these two or three, that's going to change. This is a real meeting with Jesus. This is a true repentance, a coming to Jesus moment. And you will not disappoint. You will come in, you will sup with them, you will eat with them. You will train their minds and their hearts, the word of God. And their life will change dramatically. And people will start looking and say, man, what happened to them? But it'll be a good thing. And their names will be written down in your book, the family Bible. <laughs> You're going to adopt them. So what's yours becomes theirs. Eternal life. You can't top that one. Father, I thank you for them today. And this is how we're going to pray with them, Lord. Father, please forgive me. For I know I have sinned against you and your word. But I don't want to do that anymore. I want to change. So I'm turning. I'm turning away from my own God-likeness. And I'm turning to you. I want you to be my Savior. You to be my Lord now. And I repent. And I ask you, will you forgive me of all my wrongdoing? Will you cleanse me with the precious blood that your son shed on that cross 2,000 years ago? I believe in that. I know what he did, and I believe it's for me. I want a new life. Father, if they prayed that sincerely, we know this. The Bible says that 
you are faithful and just to forgive them of their sin. Right now, it's as if they've never sinned at all. You came and you washed them clean right now. You washed them clean with the precious atoning blood of Jesus. Now they have a brand new relationship. They're babes in Christ. Father, they need your word now. They need help. People to help them along the way and show them the way. When we're babes, we need somebody to help us in all activities of life. May we be willing and ready to do that, Father, for these precious people. Today we honor you. We thank you for their life. We thank you right now. There is an incredible, joyous party going on in heaven because that heaven is rejoicing. They came to you. I thank you for that right now. And we rejoice with them right now, and we praise you. Can you give honor and glory to God for what he's done in the lives of people? Hallelujah. I pray, God, for a revival spirit to begin to grow in your true church, in the remnant church. What the world needs more than anything right now, it's not more government, it's not more this, it's not more, it's not more free money. What the world needs right now is a whole lot more of Jesus. And you're going to get it through us. The church has to be revived. Revive your church, Almighty God. Let the fire of God begin to touch every heart. Lighten every heart with the burning passions for Jesus Christ, we pray. And we give you praise. We give you honor in the one and only, holy, precious name of Jesus our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Ushers, would you come? This offering is going to go to the Gideons. Amen? It's going to go to the Gideons. So we thank God for them and their ministry. Art, Rusty, thank you for coming today. Tom, Jan, thank you for your many years of ministry. Nick and Becky, thank you for your ministry in, in Gideons. May the Lord bless that ministry and multiply. Amen? Rick Browns, you ask God to bless this offering.